Hello. Welcome back. I'm back. This is a good day because we're all back. It's hard to feel centered because <laughs> um, I'm in a different place than I normally am. Um, an important note before we get started on this video. I will be doing book stuff, like my June book stuff, on Saturday. So you're seeing this on Thursday. You should be seeing book stuff on Saturday. Um, last semester has been really intense. And so I'm gonna take a lot of what I've learned over the last semester in sort of church history courses and my passion for systematic theology on, um, yeah, make it a little queer because it's Pride Month and all theology should be more queer if you ask me. So, yeah. Um, so, what is systematic theology? What is queerness? I think it's easiest if we start with queerness rather than systematic theology. One moment, I'm gonna coffee sip. So queerness is an umbrella term for uh, sexual and gender groups that don't fit within the cisgender heterosexual norm. And it, um, tends to be something that goes against the traditional societal categories that we have put forth for both of those things. Um, and importantly, to say, oh, I'm queering something, that can mean one of two things. Either, you know, if, you, if you're taking the sort of archaic, old-fashioned version, it can mean to ruin or to spoil something, or it can mean to bring something into a broader worldview to sort of decouple um, something from its larger traditional societal motifs. And so the series aims to sort of pull systematic theology away from, not the Holy Mother, because I think the Holy Mother is more expansive than cisgender, white, heterosexual men. But like, you know, you gotta hold them accountable sometimes. Um, you're gonna move momentarily, ah, and you can see what an absolute mess my bed is right now. Um, so yes, and in so doing, we're trying to like question and hold the world as we see fit um, in our faith and our sexuality sort of simultaneously. So yes, likewise, systematic theology is clearly the study of God, the idea of theology, what we believe is the church, um, but in context with um, sort of taking the traditional beliefs, the dogmas of the church, the Bible, reason, experience, and forcing them all together into a complicated, well, not a complicated, but a clear and cohesive narrative. Um, often a complicated one, but it, you know, it can be either. Can, sometimes it's very simplistic. Um, and within this piece, within this ideology of theology, or this department of theology, as one author I read this morning called it, there are three sort of major touch points. There's methodology, there's historical um, writers of note, and there are... Hmm, the subject matters. Sorry, I have something in my throat. Um, so I think it's helpful to start with the methodology of systematic theology or like the the very basics, the things that everyone agreed on. Oh no. Um, within theology so that we can like, you know, have a good touch point. Also, I think it's important to note that this is a series. There will be more videos coming out and these videos will make systematic theology a lot more queer than this sort of explanatory video, <laughs> this introductory piece does. Um, so methodologically, systematic theology of any faith in praxis, but, but because I work in Christian faith, Christian faith, um, is trying to ask three questions. First, or three sets of questions more accurately. First, 
what is the nature of religious experience? Um, sorry, I'm looking at my notes. What's the real, the nature of religious experience? And specific to the faith, why are we interested in that uh, experience? And specific to queerness, why are we interested in this experience through a queer lens? Why does all of that matter to the conversation we are going to have, we need to have, whatever? Um, second, what is the significance of these experiences? And why, why do these experiences and people that have these experiences matter in the world? Um, so let's say if we're, we're going with our example of Christianity, why do Christian people matter in the world? What's the relationship there? And finally, um, do the experiences match the dogmas? Do the experiences of people of that religious life, do they match the set faith values um, that have been put in place by the church? by the overarching body that has, I don't know, made them. Um, are these dogmas just intellectual? And finally, the most important question for any systematic theologian of any faith, is the God we're espousing real? Um, that last question is unanswerable. <laughs> Just in case you're wondering. Um, so you you might be, and, and I think importantly, you might be wondering or saying to yourself, okay, these are super overwhelming questions. They're too vague. Or, or maybe you're like, oh, these are such simple questions. Blah, 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 blah. Here are my answers. But that's the thing. There's no good, easy, quick answer to any of these questions. Not not ones that are thoughtful and actually matter to the people that you're trying to answer them to, right? Like if, if you just say, oh, here are my answers. Well, no, that doesn't matter to the people you're, you're loving or you're trying to um, experience life with. It, you're just giving answers to give answers so that you don't have to feel discomfort. And the whole, the whole point of this kind of theology and the whole reason I think that it's so important for the church at large to be doing systematic theology is because if we believe we have the answers we have cordoned ourselves off from the realities of people that might deeply disagree with the answers um, is why you don't see a lot of the systematic theologies in the postmodern period because because liberation theology has taken the day and it is saying no 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 the strength of systematic theology that you thought you had no longer exists it doesn't it's not as strong as people think it is because there are so many experiences in the world and so many diverge from this very intellectual very european very white um very male experience of the world. Um, and so, this is a weird transition, but, but, but so what many systematicians do um, is they turn to the traditional major voices, all of which are largely white, European, and male. <laughs> I think there's only one non-white, non-European, well, maybe non-European on this list. Coffee sip. Um, and he's the first one we're going to talk about. So, um, generally we turn to the historical voices, like I've said. Um, the first major historical voice is the, the voice that I was often turned to, sorry, um, within, uh, within the, the Eastern Orthodox or the Orthodox view of things. And that is uh, St. John of Damascus, or often who systematicians call the Damascene. Um He is often seen as a, I don't know, I don't know how to explain him well. 
he is most notable for his work regarding um, the iconoclasm, specifically in favor of icons, if I remember correctly, and the Assumption of Mary. His most notable work is called uh, The Fountain of Knowledge. It is his systematic theology. Um, he's often turned to, if you need a really good, strong, uh, pre-modern conciliar voice, um, or, I mean, some might call him patristic. I think he's a little too late to be patristic. He's, I mean, he's during the iconoclasm, which means that he's working in and around sort of the sixth and seventh councils. Um, so I, 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 I you know. But anyway, St. John the Damascian, the Fountain of Knowledge, that's the first major voice. The second is Thomas Aquinas in his, um, his tome Summa Theologia, or The Sum of All Theology. Um, his work is largely seen as the basis of Catholic theology, or the basis of scholastic theology. Um, Aquinas is notable for a lot of things. He's deeply Aristotelian, which makes a lot of the more platonic voices within Christianity sort of balk. Um, you know, he's... Also, I, I just feel like I need to say, if you think that there's a better prima facie Catholic systematic theologian in the last thousand years since Thomas, please go ahead and tell me in the comments. I desperately would love to read them and draw my own conclusions. Um, Thomas is notable for sort of the being the summit and summary of scholasticism, which often means that people feel like there are just times when he's sort of out there. Um, <laughs> and, and we'll talk about this when we touch on angelology. He you know, sort of his work is what allows people to see the idea of um, X number of angels dancing on the head of a pin, which is a little bit intense. Um, yeah, I don't know. Lots of people question, see. Um, but Thomas Aquinas, he's, uh, he's worth it. He's worth the read. He is kind of intense, but he's definitely worth the read. Um, next is Philip Melechthon. He is the major sort of Lutheran voice on, in systematic theology. His book, Loci Communes, or The Common Places, is known for sort of the backlash it got within Lutheranism um, during the late 15 and early 1600s, um, or mid-15 to early 1600s. Uh, it's decent. It's good work. I, I mean, I don't, I don't have a lot to say on Philip Malekthin. Um, other than he sort of provides an equally apt view on justification and sanctification as our next author, who is of course John Calvin, um, who, those are both volumes, by the way, of my copy of Calvin's Institutes of the Christian Religion. Um, these are two sort of voices of the reformer, the reform, the Protestant movement. Um, Calvin often is seen as the reformed voice, although I don't really know what that means. Um, but he, along with Philip Melanchthon, helps sort of systematize um, modern soteriology in a really... Um, strong, definable way. Um, so if you talk about atonement or justification or sanctification um, or total depravity or limited atonement or um, undeserved grace, all of those are ideas that are sort of, sort of come from, no, I, I mean, limited atonement is not within the institutes directly, but but all of those ideas in praxis come sort of from the work of John Calvin. Um, finally, there's Frederick Friedrich Schleiermacher, who's sort of the liberal theology voice. Um, 
in regard to systematic theology, his work tries, well, doesn't try, uh, his work makes systematics less an idea of trying to understand the totality of tradition, reason, and um, biblical interpretation, and makes it more about creating central axioms around which one can ethically live. Um, so, for instance, if you've read any of Jorgen Moltmann's work, if you've worked in or around uh, any of having like Bavinck's work, well, Bavinck's is technically dogmatics, dogmatic theology, not systematic theology, which there's like a very fine line there, but but those are both sort of um, sort of deeply influenced by Schleiermacher. Bavinck is ostensibly trying to bring this book into the 19th century. Uh, he writes Reformed Dogmatics. So, an interesting character, right? <laughs> um, and then, so these are the common themes, the common subjects that come out um, from these, these voices, these traditional. So first there is what's called theology proper or proper theology. It's the study of God and our understanding of the character and persons of God. Uh, and so immediately then you have to talk about patrology, Christology, and pneumatology. Patrology is the study of God the parent. Christology is obviously study of the study of God, uh, uh, <laughs> the person of Christ. And I don't know how, why that was so hard to say. Um, and pneumatology is the study of God, the spirit. Um, and these all sort of touch on the same ideas of how does this person play in the world of, sorry, I have to check where, oh, the world of eternality, the worlds of omnipotence, omniscience. Um, omnipotence is all powerfulness. Omniscience is all knowingness. Uh, omnibenevolence or all goodness. Um, oh God, I'm so sorry. Uh, oh, and omnificent, um, which is creator of all things, sustainer of all things. Also, how does that, that same God play in the world of immovability, which is the unchangeable nature of God, impassibility, so the separation between the persons of God and yet their interconnectedness, right? So like, how did, you know, we say that pain is impassable, God is impassable. So when Christ died on the, on the cross, God the Father, God the Parent, did not die with God, Christ, who is God, right? The Spirit did not die with Christ, who is God. It, that's impassibility. Um, and the issue of, oh no, 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 oh, and the issue of theodicy. Why is there a good God if there's evil in the world? Um, proper theology is an interesting, it's often what, takes the most time in systematics because none of the rest of systematics really matters if you don't have a very distinct view of God and your doctrines of the parent doctrine of Christ, doctrine of the spirit, doctrine of creation. We, if those aren't there, if those aren't sort of solidified, right, everything kind of falls apart. So that will be the next video. We'll talk about theology proper and God as a queer God and why, why that's sort of important and necessary as we continue in, in the faith. Um, next is angelology. Aquinas especially, but, but mostly medieval theologians spend a lot of time on this. Um, this is dealing with what we'd call lesser celestial beings or beings that are are below God, but serve God in ways that are not physical, where the soul is not attached to the nephesh, right? Um, so this can be messengers, this can be protectors, this can be um, beings like seraphim and cherubim and thrones that we see throughout the Old Testament waiting on God, protecting 
protecting is the wrong word, but protecting the universe from the, the glory of God. Um, and yeah, again, there's that weird saying about uh, X number of angels dancing on the head of a pin. It's, it's a really huge, angelology is a really huge concept in medieval systematics, especially. Um, I mean, you can, we, you know, if you've seen like modern shows like um, Supernatural or even The Conjuring, angelology's idea of choirs and spheres are um, super important to Christian understandings of angels and demons, right? Because if angels are one way, then demons must be the reverse, right? They must be the same, but evil. Um, I would also say to you that in modern systematics, <laughs> angelology doesn't come up too often. Sometimes it's discussed, but it's it's never in depth, and um, it's never in depth, and it's it's always kind of complicated. Um, next field would be bibliology or bibleology, depending on how you want to say it. This is the study of the Bible and the canon and um, Sorry, sort of the interplay between the spirit as formation or formative to um, the biblical experience and the spirit as interpretation or interpretive to the biblical experience. Um, I think most modern, very good um, biblologists or biblical theologians would tell you that both are true. I should also mention that biblical theology is a weird term within theology because sometimes sometimes we th say biblical theology and we mean exegetical theology, which is theology that comes directly from the biblical text. Sometimes we say biblical theology or bibleology and we mean um, sort of a motif that sort of sits in between the um, liberal theology school and the fundamental theology school. In modern American theology, um, sometimes when we say biblical theology, we mean uh, folks like this, Wayne Grudem, who's one of the major evangelical systematic theologians, and their sort of um, odd black and white understanding of systematics, because the first thing they do is say, okay, this is what the Bible says, this is what is true. Um, and so bibliology then, in any systematic, is the question that you are asking about, okay, what is general revelation? What is special revelation? How high of an authority is the Bible? How high, it, how much higher of an authority is God? Um, are there central principles and axioms in a Schlermachian system, right, that we can understand from the Bible? Do we take the entire Bible as literal? Does that mean then we have to be Messianic Jews? Right, it's it's a there are a, a bevy of questions that come with bibliology, um, and none of them are really easy to answer because any of them, answering any of them one way or the other is deeply exclusionary. And I think that good systematicians are wary of excluding people because we've worked so hard to sort of heal the fissions that have come from our earlier sort of. That's heresy days. And, and so more and more, I think, healthily, we're questioning whether or not heresy is actually heresy. Um, and and what, um, what really sort of staunchly defines and who has the power to sort of uh, set up what heresy is and how we, how we did, uh, deal with heresy. Um, which brings us, interestingly, to ecclesiology, which is the study of the church. Um, so that can be church history, that can be polity, so how the church is run, that can be discipline, can be origin. Um, it can also be sort of the, um, sorry. It can also be communal salvation and the, the communal response to what happens in the New Testament. Ecclesiology is the, um, it, 
it's the question of why do people in the church, why does the church behave the way the church does? Think of ecclesiology as like church psychology. Um, and and the, the myriad of reasons why we do ecclesiology and polity are, are a lit, you know, they're vast, but I think that um, the best ecclesiologists I know can do all of it. They can, they can talk about the ordainable offices in Church A and the history of Church B and and do it all without bias, um, or at least without exposing their biases readily because they've told you up front, here's where I'm biased, here's how I know myself, here's what I did to try and keep that in check. Um, Another thing that comes with ecclesiology is how does the church survive eschatology? Um, so eschatology is the study of last things. I cannot possibly get into it because we've done 26 minutes already and that would be another half hour, 45 minutes, um, just on, just on <laughs> eschatology. Um, there are a lot of odd divisions. There are a lot of overlapping pieces. Again, just just go watch that video. It will be in this playlist somewhere. Anywho, um, likewise is amartology, which is the study of sin and sin's divisions. Medieval theologians loved this one too. Um, one of the most notable amartologists is uh, Augustine and his ideas of original sin. Again, it's such a diverse field that I have not done enough reading on in some time. So I'm just gonna, you know, avoid talking about it until I film that video. Um, finally, soteriology is the study of, well, not finally, there are two more. Uh, soteriology is the study of um, salvation, how we're saved. Um, so that means that it's the study of the redemptive act itself, Jesus dying on the cross. It also means that it is the study of what we call the big three. So justification, or how we become right with God, atonement, God's forgiveness of us through Christ, and um, sanctification. So the Holy Spirit making us holy as we live into the promises Christ has given us. Um, there are seven atonement theories. I'm sure someone will come out with another one. I love seven because I think that it covers the breadth of it. And I think I'm hesitant to sit down on one singular rock pile and say, this is the right one. I don't know if we can, um, if we can question something well, if we can reason something like the salvific act, the redemptive moment, so deeply that we know exactly what ha happened. I think all of our theorems are just pittances um, to the beautiful work that God did on that mountain. And I think it's important to know that. Um, if you sort of want a good primer, a good introduction, Fleming Rutledge's crucifixion talks primarily about penal substitutionary atonement. Um, but it is, it is the, uh, it is sort of the prima facie piece, the, the, the largest chunk that is worthy of your time and energy and understanding. Um, if you want more recommendations for salvific pieces. I'm happy to give them to you. You know? Um, and finally is uh, theological anthropology, which is the question of um, what is the nature of man? And how can man act holy in this world if the world is not holy? Um, oh no, I didn't play this well. Sorry. The major book I would recommend to you on this, oh, there are two, and they're right next to each other. Oh, thank goodness. The, the major books I would recommend this to you on this are The Violence of Love by St. Oscar Romero. It, this is a collection of his sermons. He's teaching um, against the violence in El Salvador um, in the 70s. And um, I 
I don't, there's just something about this that I think speaks really well to theological anthropology. Um, it, because, because it shows us both what man is deeply, deeply violent, but it also shows us the capacity of man to lean into what we call the Imago Dei or the image of God. Um, and the complicated relationship between both parts of us, both sin and the image of God. Um, in a world that is, as that is suffering because of our sin, um, it's a really interesting conversation. Also importantly is the Theology for a Social Gospel by Walt Rauschenbusch. This is in its own right a systematic theology. Um, but it is one that focuses on leaning not into our nature of original sin, but understanding our sanctification in such a way that we lean into the image of God within our own being um, and build a better world that might be able to call forth the kingdom of God more holy. Um, it's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful book. And I recommend... Um, yeah, all of them, not Wayne Grudem's, but all of the other ones I recommend pretty deeply. And yeah, that's that's sort of my primer on systematic theology for you. It like does systematics no justice and like also I think is far too long. You're probably asking, Emily, how is any of this queer? You just told us about systematic theology for like 30 minutes, maybe 20 minutes. If we were lucky, Phenomenal point. Um, this introductory piece, as I said, isn't isn't going to be introductory, or isn't going to be intro isn't going to be particularly queer because I think the definitions really help us. Um, but as we there's someone going up the stairs, so if you can hear that, I'm so sorry. But as we progress through these topics, I think it's very important to to know what each topic is about, have a basic primer, and to know the people that um, I'll be talking about, because we're gonna do um, 10 videos in total, including this introduction and sort of a summary on the wholeness and the queerness of systematics. Um, yeah, I'm really excited to go on this journey um, with you all and to do the thing. Uh, yeah, we'll talk to you all later. So, like, subscribe, comment down below what you're most interested in, if you're even interested in this. Um, tell me how you feel about this particular topic, and tell me if you actually are happy to see me, or if you thought I was dead. Both are valid. <laughs>